Uh, I'm a computer scientist, and I have been working in the area of uh, medical informatics for years. And uh, obviously, uh, brain disease is one of the important research area, become more and more important. But the translation research on the brain disease is really require a lot of data, particularly now in a clinical study. This is largely due to the maturity of uh, the image technology. So we now have, a, in a highly constrained environment, we have the FR machine, the clinical institutions, but we also, also have the EEG become more and more pervasively used. But also in the brain disease research, the body sensor play a very important role to monitoring the people's behavior and record this one as a clinical measurements. And all this data will combined with molecular level profiling, like we heard this morning a lot, for example, the gene expression. And all this information were combined together to constitute the uh, study of uh, clinically meaningful biomarker, which is uh, yesterday, uh, Michael gave a very good uh, keynote speech about it. So in order to utilize this massive information, we really needed to do two things. One is you have to build uh, infrastructure to manage those data. This data is the integration between the clinical information as well as the um, uh, molecular level of information. In, in the clinical information level, there are different kind of modality providing you the different measurements of the phenotype. All this data should be put in together. And also, the second one is you really need a good analytics platforms. So therefore, all this uh, uh, data can be studied. But the very important thing here now is by the clinical uh, clinicians, by doctors. So this is really the goal of the eTrix project, which now I'm leading, is the European Translation of Informatics Platforms, which have the goal to build in five years' time, now already in the year two, to have a common platform to manage and analysis the two buildings on my projects. So you probably People know in Europe, we have invested the IMI uh, research initiative, the uh, Innovative Research, Medical Research Initiative. So pharmaceutical company with academic institution work together on the various diseases and generate a lot of clinical related uh, information, clinical data plus the molecular profiling. And all this data will be measured and actually be managed by a single platform and then we hope to do analysis on this platform. So, Obviously, uh, quite a number of the disease we are now dealing with is the brain disease. So therefore, this platform have to have the capacity to analysis the brain disease as well. So therefore, the extension of the traditional uh, translation research was largely focused on the uh, clinical measurements uh, integrated with molecular profile to extend to a different kind of modality. For example, here, a particular mention here now is uh, you have the image processing and image analysis workflows. Also, you will have the real uh, mechanism to deal with the uh, patient records as well dealing with the uh, lifestyle measurements, use the body sensor. All these are quite important uh, phenotypical information. And then, of course, same as the other disease, molecular level profiling is very important. And what you're doing here now is you organize with certain ontology, provide a flexible data model, and drive a real good uh, advanced uh, analytical workflow. So today I will just talk about these two. One is the data integration, another one is the, some analytics we develop. So taking one example, I know we, this is a project we are doing now in the Imperial, is the, is the multiple scores. And uh, this is a typical sort of the data integration uh, structure. Uh, you have the patient data, you monitor it on the quality of life here, and then uh, you have the image data here, clinician provide the, the really the historical uh, uh, clinical conditions as well as the information about all the patients, basically the patient records, and now your nurse monitoring the treatment as well as the 
uh, the following the patient for the longitudinal study. So all this information will be rolling through the clinical report forms and the two uh, related to the database in the e -checks. So that is the data, and also all the T-shirts here, you will put to the biobank, and this T-shirt will be used for generic molecular profile. So the integration is really, in a big summary, we integrate these four parts. So uh, Transmart is used, as uh, uh, Sean just mentioned, as a core molecular profiling uh, repository uh, for e -checks. However, it's been extended to are using the different databases for managing the different mortality information. For example, the XNet was used to do the image data management. So what we have to do is that we have integrated all this information uh, together to form a uniform uh, repository for brain study. Here is particularly, yeah, we will see, in the integration now, XNet was one part of the e uh, platforms for, um, for medical image storage, but we put uh, the morphology information inside into the CD, uh, into the uh, E-Trex, into the Transmart, based on using the ontologies come from the C-Disk. So basically clinical data standard, clinical research data standard. So in this way, we allow people to actually ask this kind of uh, query. For example, you brought me uh, a score, uh, for, for multiple schoolers, and this is multiple schoolers, a quality for life score. And then what you're doing here now is you see that for this guy, for all those people after the treatment, and still experience a couple of relapse, and also show some reason of the white matter. So you can actually search, for example, all the images, all the peoples, and within such a framework. So that is the, uh, really the, uh, basic function you need to support for really the clinical study. And the data model is actually quite, uh, quite simple. We have this kind of structure. And the one is uh, uh, you have, as you can see, the data was organized based on CDX standard. And then you, you can see on the medical records level, you provide uh, necessary information of the patients. And then on the morphology level, you provide all the information about the, the, the brain structure, and you've got the device information as the provenance, and have the images and on the XNet linked through this all indexing to, to the, to the, to the E-TRIX platform. So this is the, a quick screenshot and uh, see how this system actually work. What you pay attention to here now is this ontology structure, which is a really compliant to CDX, which allow you to navigate uh, the repositories with all the four pieces of information, medical records, morphologies, and the treatments, as well as the other patient lifestyle information from this structure. And that's what give you the answers. And then you can drive the analysis packages workflow to do all the analysis. So, okay. The next part, I talk a bit more about analysis. I think this is also quite an important part. So each ex definitely adopted all the existing uh, methods for, for image analysis, a particular focus on FMI. Um, because this one is clinically used uh, uh, intensively in the, in the clinical study. So here, basically, we use the FMI analysis, and it's actually probably what we all know, and that's have two sides. One is you, maybe people call it brain mapping. You provide the stimuli, and then you identify which brain, uh, uh, part of the brain would take the response. And the other one is the reverse, right? This is more like you build a model here. And here now is you build a predictive model, you get a, you know, the brain activity, and then you can predict the status of the stimuli. So that is the two sides. But what we are doing this, both sides have a very big clinical application. What we are doing here now is we enhance the methods to support efficient analysis in the environment. So I don't need to tell you too much about the, the image analysis. I think here is the expert community here. But just a quick overview. The, 
basically use the bring mapping methods is is a really like uh, like SPM is really very much based on the idea of the general linear regression. Here, this is about the signals. Here is design matrix, which is provided you the really the explanatory the vectors, and then this gives you the regression actually the parameter, which is provided you the uh, correlation between the both the signal as a particular signal. Uh, this one is designed by Convolute, the, the actual homodynamics models with actually the stimuli. So the, this one you can really use a statistic test, you can actually find out the significant data which is uh, related to the signal, which, which actually means which particular uh, uh, stimuli is related to this particular uh, border signal. So this idea can be actually extended uh, straightforwardly to actually doing a simple test in the clinical environment. So this is the one of the work we are doing here now. It actually for MS, we want to verify this hypothesis. So the patients with the, uh, with the MS still have the preserved brain plasticity. So we actually did experiments. It's kind of uh, activity. You scan the brains. Uh, before the treatment, and then two weeks later, you do the same test after treatment, and you compare the, the image. So you can actually do simply use the linear uh, uh, regressions, general linear model, actually do to compute the difference and find out the big delta x, and which find out the related uh, uh, brain uh, voxel, and identify which one is caused a significant change. But the issue here now is uh, how to detect a significant change to voxel. And we, we actually, standard way was to basically use the uh, linear, uh, general linear models. Can be directly used and then do statistics test. But then we find out actually uh, we have uh, immediate problems when dealing with the clinical, really the image. One thing is uh, when you see in the previous thing, this one, right? After you really aggregated uh, actually the noise, and the signal noise ratio is actually become the even lower. So therefore, you really have the problem of the very noisy signal. The second one is many idea when you do the uh, unit test, and you based on the idea of this independent of the voxel is not really realistic. So in this way, we have to think about uh, a new method, which is uh, one is can be computation, computation efficient. The second one, we can avoid the problems of, uh, um, of the two I mentioned, the low signal noise ratio, as well as the in, in unrealistic um, assumption of independence of the voxel. So what we're actually working on here now is we are not really talking comparison voxel one by one, or we take the whole voxel matrix to do the, to do the real the optimization. This optimization we take the, actually in the, in the machine learning, right? We talk this call, uh, really the optimizing this uh, regulated uh, object function. So we are not just interested in uh, minimize this residue. That's the usual way you do the GIM. But what you really care about is two, another important property of the model. The one of the model here now is sparseness. So basically, you can imagine when you have the, really the two status, only few voxel and all, only few brain regions will actually change, right? Because most of them have no change. So this cost, uh, this delta, is actually should be quite sparse. The second one we should really think about is this, uh, uh, called the smoothness. Probably you can talking about uh, is modern dependency between the between the voxel be, between the region could be two way right one between the voxels another one can think about it between the region and here you can do a simple way in our work we just simply assume the neighboring sort of the uh, voxel should act uh, similar but you can actually now really use a much better way of thinking about that as to take into consideration the, the structures of the neural. So you can compute uh, uh, actually the uh, connectivity metrics, use this one here. So this is give you the really the optimization function. So what basically say is you, you will find a model rather not just uh, have a small residues, means the small error, and, but you also have a sparse 
have a sparse enough, right? So only a few uh, works for you pay attention as well as you look into the smoothness. And then I optimize the entire function. But reversely, you can say is uh, this lambda, this is the penalty um, uh, variables, actually provide you the actual trade-off or balance between the importance of the uh, smallest residue, uh, small error, or the sparse. But in another way, you give a lambda, there were different kind of the delta xi be computed, right? So what we are interested in here now is uh, a delta xi which can survive the most of the lambda. What I mean is given each uh, delta x, you will have a lambda corresponding to it. You have one, a sequence of lambda, right? Start from the very big one to small one. The big lambda will make this one very sparse, and the small one will make the model less sparse. But what you're interested on here now is uh, the uh, variation of the effects such that it actually survive in an even very sparse model. So that's kind of the uh, variation you really pay attention, right? So this is probably you mean that voxel is really have the most significant change. So what we're doing here now is instead of using the instead of using the t-test or using the status test plus the actually the p-value as the cut. And what we're doing here now is we use the lambda directly as the one of the new statistical variables to detecting what is the important change of the effects. So this one gives you one example. When the lambda is very, very big, all the uh, delta x are zero. So the model is, is, is totally sparse. And then you start to reduce the number. And suddenly you find when you reach the A9, this particular uh, delta x is now not zero. And then reduce further, this three not zero. Uh, release this one is all the, uh, not zero. So you can see for this one, the lambda associated with A is nine. For this one associated with six. Use this number as a measurement to measure stability of the variation around the sparseness change. So this is quite good. Uh, it's a very simple algorithm. You can run it very quickly, but then afterwards you do the permutation test, and you find that the most significant, significant CR in the permutation test, and you rank the, uh, them based on two values. One is the big value, the number of the lambda, as well as the statistic uh, p-value. Together, and you get your rank. So in this way, we can actually do a test, which we find out, and uh, it's a, it actually very successful, and uh, it's certainly better than the traditional uh, GRM methods, and, but also better than the, uh, this TFECE, which is uh, uh, imperial now. They are in the library, they use this methods, and now our methods is uh, are performed very nicely. The, the next one is a quickly go slow is the, the prediction. In the prediction side, in our uh, model, we build uh, uh, workflows for multi uh, voxel uh, pattern analysis. So this idea is pretty, pretty simple. You give a stimuli and you find out, right, the correspondent vectors, like what I said in the brain mapping. And afterwards, you run multiple uh, uh, stimulation and you labor, right, all the, all the uh, voxels which is, uh, uh, have the uh, uh, response. And then you build a predictive model or classification model. When you have an input, you don't, this is the brain reading, you have uh, one of the uh, voxel um, pictures, and then you can actually, from the brain, it can predict uh, what kind of status is actually the stimuli. So that is the brain reading model here. So what we are doing here, we're still working on the linear sparse model for this work, but as we said before, right, because of the brain mapping model is, is highly sparse. So therefore, uh, the linear sparse model is a very good choice for working on that, right? But we still have some uh, difficulty here. So the difficulty here now is sample size. So no matter how actually, uh, how, much, how many money you have got, how many scans you can do for the brain, you still have a very small number compared with the voxels. But fortunately, because it's a, a sparse 
uh, metrics, so we can use compensation methods to overcome the problem. But still, even in the compensation, you still need to talking about the sample number should close to this much. So S is the uh, non-zero, right? So non-zero uh, non um, vo uh, voxels within the within the no change of, uh, voxels uh, within this uh, P. So, but the number is still big, okay? So in this case, we were thinking about how to reduce this number so make our uh, recovery algorithm is better. So in this way, we did a work. Okay. Uh, in, in this work, we did, I, I'll be quick, okay? In this work, we did a, a sub, uh, sort of ensemble learning. Basically, we cut the, actually the voxel sets into subset and then learn the submodel. Afterwards, we rank it. So, but in this model here, we have a big problem here now. It's called stability. So yesterday, we mentioned about the reliability of the biomarker. Remember, we are actually looking for is the biomarker is, uh, is the uh, voxels which is correlated to the response. So in order to have the meaningful uh, biomarker, you need a stable. So basically, means during the cross validations and all this, no, no matter how you cut it, all this voxel uh, on the sample, all this voxel should stay there in all the models. So usually people do the model selection, only care about the predictive performance. In our case, we combine the performance with the stability. So this is another very big work we, we we're doing to developing this workflow for finding the stable biomarker, in this case, uh, response voxels in the images when you do a clinical study. So usually people don't really care too much about stability, but this is a very good issue. So I, I won't be able to have a chance to talk too much about that. There's a paper published in the, in the journal, you can have a look. And you can see here, our model is a trade-off between the high, high predictive p p position, but also with actually a very good uh, stability. So the order box inside is survived in the order cross validation. So I think I, this is the, uh, yeah, to conclude my talk. So basically we build two things. We build a repository now to actually have the uh, medical image uh, managed, aligned with the clinical information, and so people can answer the clinical relevant questions with respect to the, um, the image study. The second one is we're developing many workflows uh, to actually do the image analysis. All these workflows is somehow enhanced or adapted the traditional uh, medical uh, image processing for actually neuroscience study to the clinical context when you deal with a large, big of the big uh, image repository. So that's pretty much my talk. Thank you. <laughs>